Hi, my name is Methat El Masri. The title of today's video is ASP.NET 6 Minimal Web API with SQLite. In this tutorial, we're going to use ASP.NET 6.0 Minimal Web API. We will build a simple application that uses SQLite to save students' data. We will then consume the API from an HTML page. So let's get started. The first thing we do is to create our web API application. We'll do that from the command line with .NET, new web API, and the framework I'm targeting is .NET 6.0. And I do not need HTTPS for this very simple application. So I'm going to put the no HTTPS switch and I will be using minimal API. So I'll use the use minimal API switch and my output directory will be students API because I'll be modeling students in this solution. I made a typo here, so I'll just fix that and off it goes. Let me change directory into that folder and open my code in VS Code. Let's start the app. So I'm going to type in .NET Watch. This will open up the application in a browser. And let's see what it looks like. And here it is. So you get this Swagger interface. And there is one service, it's called Weather Forecast. You can test it out by clicking on Get here, try it out, and execute. So it's going to return some weather forecasting information. So let's look into our code and understand where this is coming from. If you open up program.cs, you will see here the main service is over here. So you have here an endpoint, which is slash weather forecast. That's why we can go into our browser and hit slash weather forecast and it will take us to the service. Let's try that out. I'll do this slash weather forecast and I should be able to hit that service. Now, we don't really need this because we're going to create our own. So what I'll do is I'm going to delete all of the stuff that I don't need. So I'm going to delete this array of strings. I'm going to delete this endpoint and I'll delete this record at the very bottom and let's leave the very bare bones of our application. Since I will be using SQLite, I'm going to add these packages to my application. These two packages pertain to SQLite. These three packages pertain to Entity Framework and I have another package here called CSV Helper and this package will help me read a CSV file. The reason I want to read a CSV file is because I'm going to seed my database students table with about 50 plus students. So let me add these packages to my application. So I'm going to copy this and go into the terminal window, stop the server with control C. So I'll paste these commands here. In the file system of my application, I'm going to add a couple of folders. I want to have a models folder and also a data folder and a www root folder. In the www root folder, I'm going to place a students.csv file and I'll show you what the contents look like. This is basically four columns of data and they consist of student ID, first name, last name and school and there are 57 of these. This is my sample data. Back in VS Code, I just added a data folder, a models folder and a www root folder that contains students.csv. In the models folder, I will create a class called student and the student class will look like this. We've got a student ID, last name, first name and school. I need to add a connection string to the app settings.json for my SQLite database and that would look like this. 
the connection strings section and in there there's a default connection and I'm going to call my SQLite database school.db. Since we're using entity framework, we need to have a database context class. So in this data folder, I'm going to create a new class and I'll call it school db context. The db context class will look like this. So let me resolve these namespaces for db context and the student class. And this is to do with that CSV import package that I told you about. Let me resolve this. And this is system globalization. I think we have one more, which is CSV reader. Now let's look at the contents of our DB context class. The school DB context class, it inherits from DB context. We have one collection which translates into one table in the database and it is this student's DB set. This is the constructor for school DB context and this is the on model creating method that will seed sample data. It gets its data from this method get students and get students goes off reads the students.csv file and constructs a list of student objects and returns that so the students objects is used here to seed the database in the program.cs file we need to add some code that will associate the database context class with the connection string so right before builder build we will add some other code here which looks like this we first resolve these namespaces this line of code reads the connection string and here we're basically associating this connection string with this school db context class and in addition it registers school db context as a singleton we're now ready to do entity framework migrations. So let's go into the terminal window and type in the following .NET EF migrations add and we'll call the migration M1 and the output directory will be data slash migrations. This should add a migration inside of this data folder. It will show up in a moment if all goes well. And now if we go into that folder, here's our migrations. And if we open this file, you'll see that these are the commands that will create for us our students table. And you can see here that we're about to insert all these students into the database. We can actually apply those migrations by typing in .NET EF database update. And this will create for us the school.db database and put some data into it. You can see here that it's doing a bunch of insert statements. We can check the contents of our database because here it is. If you install a SQLite extension here, it will allow you to have a look at the contents of the database. And this is the extension that I have installed. So I can come here, open database. And if I expand this, I can go to students and show table. And you can see here that the database has been populated with data. Now is the fun part of actually creating these API endpoints. Since we're using the minimal APIs from ASP.NET, it actually makes it really, really simple because we don't need to have a controller. We can put all our code in program.cs. I will add just before app run, the endpoints for get, which is to read, for post, which is to insert, for put, which is to update, and for delete, which is obviously to delete data. I've got the code here. I'm just going to paste it and we will go step by step and explain what it is. So the first endpoint would be API students. And this one simply returns a list of all the students in the database. The next one is API student school, and this is a parameter that's going to be passed by the user. So the purpose of this endpoint is to return all the students that belong to a specific school. For example, if you enter nursing, it will return students that happen to be in the school of nursing. This endpoint 
returns a student by ID. And if you go API slash student, say slash 22, it will return for you the student with ID 22. This here is using the post method compared to the others that we mentioned before that are using the get method. The get method simply returns data. The post method is used for inserting data. So here a student object is going to be passed. It's going to be added to the database and the output will be a status code 201, which created produces, and it will return the student object. The next endpoint is a put endpoint, which is an update. So for this to work, we need to have the ID being passed in the URL line. We need to have the student object being passed. And over here, we're first going to find the student with this particular ID. If the student is not found, you'll get a status 404 error. Otherwise, it's going to assign the input to this student object that it found, and it's going to save the changes. Finally, we have a delete endpoint here, map delete. And to get at it, you go API students and just pass the ID. This method will find that student and simply delete the student. If it does not find the student, it's going to return a 404. So let us try this out. Let's run our application with .NET Watch, and this should open up the app in our browser. And here it is. You can test all of these endpoints. For example, I'm going to get all my students, click on try it out, execute, and here are all the students. Let's try the next get statement, which is get by school. So I'm going to click on get here, try it out, and it will ask me for a school. And I'm going to say medicine, for example, and execute. It returns for me all these students in the School of Medicine, as you can see here. Let's try one more of these gets, which is this one, get by ID. So I'm going to try it out. And for the ID, let me enter 22 and execute. And it's going to return for me the student with ID 22. Let's try to insert a student. So I'm going to click on post, try it out, and it expects me to enter data that looks like this. Now, I do not need to enter the student ID because that is automatically generated by the database. But I can enter, for example, last name, I would say Jones, and I'll make it all in capital letters so it's visible. And the first name is Jane, and the school, let's say it is computing. Let's execute. This returns a code 201, which means the record has been created. And now we have a new student ID of 58. Let me go back to the get student by ID and enter 58. It should get for me that student that I just inserted. And here it is, Jones Jane Computing. Let me update the student. So what I'll do is I'll just copy this and then come back up again, collapse the get, and let's try to do a put, which means update. So to do the put, I will say try it out. I just pasted the JSON object that I copied for student with ID 58. And let me change this to say last name, I'll say Bond, and the first name, let's say James, and let's make the school security and execute. We forgot something. The ID has to go here. So not only do you send the JSON object, you have to send the ID, which is 58. So if I click on execute now, the return value is 204 and it says success. Let's verify that. So I'm going to collapse this, go to my get by ID, enter here 58, which it's already there. Let me execute it. And now we see that this is James Bond, which is the change that I made. Finally, let's do a delete. So I'm going to click on delete and I will delete the student with ID 58. So if I execute that, it comes back and says code 200. Now, if I do a get by ID, it shouldn't find 58. Let's try that out. When I say execute, it says 404. The student does not exist. Let's try and consume this API from an HTML page. 
To do that, I will go into the WW root folder here and add an HTML page, which I will call students.html. In here, I will paste this very simple HTML code. Now, for this URL, I need to add the URL of my service. Let me copy the base URL of my service, which really stops at API students. Come into my code and paste that here. This code uses jQuery. We have a button. The ID of the button is button get data. And this is a pre section, which is an element that will be used for injecting some data. This is the starting point of jQuery. Let's start by this. When the button get data is clicked, it will call a function called get data. And what get data does is it goes to this endpoint. After the request is completed, it's going to call a function called show response. And this show response takes the data that's been received and injects it into this pre output element right here. I'm going to go into the file system, run this HTML page by simply double clicking on it in the file system. This is my application in the file system. I'll open the WW root folder and here I will simply double click on students. If I click on get data, I get an error. So I have a problem here to find out what the problem is. You need to go into the developer tools of your browser. In this case, I right clicked on the surface of the browser and I'm going to choose inspect. And if I go to console, you see this error here that says access to XML HTTP request at so and so from origin null has been blocked by course. So we have a bit of a problem. Course stands for cross origin resource sharing. In a browser, you cannot redirect the request to another site. This is the site that this page is being loaded from. Inside our source code, there is a redirection to another site, and this is not allowed unless the server provides permission to do that. So we have to enable cores in our application. So let me close this HTML page, and we need to add some code in our program.cs to enable cores. Just before our app build, we'll add this code. And this is a policy that we are adding to our services. And the name of the policy is simply policy. You can call it what you like. And this policy allows any origin, allows any method, and allows any header. Thereafter, we should use this in our application. So over here, after the builder.build, we're going to put this code to say, yes, we want to use this policy in our application. There is one other step where you actually say for every endpoint that you want to use this policy. So I'd come here and put this annotation before each one of these endpoints, basically before this async keyword. So let me resolve this using Microsoft ASP.NET Core cores. So I will take this again and copy it and paste it right before each one of these async keywords for my endpoints. We have one more, and that is the delete. At this point, we have enabled cores in our ASP.NET Web API application. Let me refresh with a control R here. Let us go to the page that previously failed. I'm going to close the console, refresh this page, click on get data, and there we go, we get our data. I hope you found this video useful, and if you did, please give it the thumbs up. I'll see you in the next video.